Uh, hello everybody, um, I'm going to talk to you about caffeine supplementation uh, <laughs> and some old stuff I've done and some new stuff I've done, so uh, let's get stuck into it then. So caffeine, uh, we all pretty much ingest it, um, it's classified as a stimulant but it's not prohibited by the World Anti-Doping Agency, so athletes are free to use caffeine. Uh, as much as they like. If you have up to about 400 milligrams per day, you can even have a bit more than that, you're not going to have any adverse effects. And I think, just to point out initially, that that's kind of a fairly typical dose that we would give somebody in a study if we were looking to get an ergogenic response. So somewhere between 300 and 400 milligrams we would give to an athlete when we were testing them. Uh, it's a member of a group of compounds called the methylxanthines, and caffeine is a trimethylxanthine. It's metabolised by the liver, so if you've had some coffee or some tea, your liver is processing that as we speak, and it's broken down to its primary metabolites, which are dimethylxanthines, uh, the main one being paraxanthine. It's water and lipid soluble, lipids meaning fats, so that means it can rapidly enter all the cells of our body. We get a peak plasma concentration, so a peak concentration in the blood, about half an hour to an hour after we've ingested some caffeine. And that's why when you look at any studies that have been done on caffeine, looking at effects on performance, they will all say that they administered the caffeine round about an hour before they actually test the athlete. So when, you, when we're looking to try and improve performance, if athletes are trying to improve performance, that's what they need to do. Not take it immediately before exercise, take it about an hour before. It's got a half-life of about four hours, which means that, it's because of the time it takes the liver to process it, means that if you have some caffeine, it's going to take four hours for what's in your system, for half of that to disappear. So after eight hours, you're still going to have a quarter of the caffeine that you had initially left in your system. Mm, yeah, my final point there. So if you have more in that time, it's going to add up. So if you're like me and you have a cup of tea first thing in the morning and then you're travelling to work and you have a cup of coffee and then maybe a couple of hours later you might have another cup of tea, you can see you can keep adding to your caffeine content during the day. Where do we get it from? Lots of places really, mostly coffee and tea. Uh, coffee, more in filter coffee than there is in instant coffee. There's a little bit in decaf. They don't remove all of it, it's just not worth the cost of actually getting rid of all of it. So there is a tiny amount, but it's very, very tiny. In tea, it depends how long you have it brewed. If you like me and you like it weak and milky, you're not going to get too much caffeine. Um, but if you're one of those people, and you know you are, who keep pressing the tea bag on the side of the cup and stirring it around, you're going to get a lot more. Um, Pepsi Cola, Coca Cola, and then these so called energy drinks, of course, these days that have quite a high content. Um, but even in something like Red Bull, you really need about three cans of Red Bull to get a normal ergogenic effect, which I'll come on to in a minute. It's also added to lots of products these days as well, so sometimes you can be ingesting caffeine and not even be aware of it. So, the first ergogenic thing I want to look at here is, is there a dose response? So, this was a study from a few years ago where they were looking at time to exhaustion. Effectively, they had people running on a treadmill at a speed that would exhaust them in about 50 minutes. In other words, they're running and running until they just can't go anymore. Uh, and they found that when they had no caffeine, they lasted about 50 minutes. When they had a three milligram or a six milligram per kilogram dose, they lasted over an hour. Big change from zero caffeine. When they gave them nine milligrams per kilogram, it actually dropped off a little bit. Still better than having nothing, but it seems that it follows this inverted U response. So if you have somewhere between three and six milligrams per kilogram, you get an optimal effect. So if you're an athlete, this is the dose you really uh, want to be taking. 
Now these slides, I'm aware, I always say when I'm watching presentations, if I can't read the slides, I always think, why have you put this up there? Um, but, <laughs> but, but I don't want you to pay any attention to this, apart from realising that there are lots of studies. This is a study that I'm actually writing up at the moment, and this is looking at uh, the effects of caffeine on real performance. So if you're Mo Farah running a 10k, or, or if you're Chris Froome in the Tour de France doing a time trial, the only thing I want you to look at is... My little where's this gone? Oh. I've done that same thing. Uh, the little pink diamond at the bottom. So this line here is the line of no effect. If that diamond sits that side of the line, it means caffeine's having a positive effect. And if it sits on this side, a negative effect. These are time trial studies. It works. It's a legal supplement and it works. And we get a typical improvement of about 3% on average in performance. So I'm just going to touch on some physiological responses as well. So heart rate. I, I had this sort of preconception when I started getting into this area that caffeine increased heart rate and I think most people kind of think the same. If we look at the time trial response, so just when people have done an actual performance, heart rate goes up by about three beats per minute. But, think back to that previous slide, they're working harder, they're, getting, they're running faster with caffeine or cycling faster. So the question I had was, how much of this is due to the fact that they're working harder because of caffeine? And how much of it is just a direct stimulatory effect of caffeine on our physiology? So this is a study I did where we got people to exercise. So this is heart rate here, and this is incremental exercise. To keep it simple, this is somebody exercising at a really low intensity, and then a little bit harder, a bit harder, a bit harder, and so on. And you can see at every intensity, heart rate goes up. If we look what happens with caffeine, it's lower at the lower intensities, Ooh, turn that one off, at the lower intensities. And in fact at rest, we found that caffeine reduces resting heart rate. And that's there in the literature. There's, there aren't too many studies that have looked at it. By about three to four beats per minute. So not a huge difference, but it, it certainly doesn't increase heart rate. It actually reduces it a bit. When Mo Farah's doing his time trial, he's working at this end. At this end, we don't get any significant change in heart rate as a result of caffeine. If we look, if we fix the intensity, so these are studies where in the caffeine condition and the placebo condition they're working at exactly the same intensity. So it's not a performance test, you're running on a treadmill with caffeine or placebo, the intensity is the same. No effect on caffeine. So just like we showed in the, the upper end of that previous slide, there's no effect of caffeine on heart rate. So what we can say is, if you're doing a time trial, you're going to be faster, and your heart rate's going to go up, but the heart rate is only going up because you're working harder, not because caffeine is doing anything to your physiology. Now often when we do physiological tests, we have a scale that we show people where we say, how hard are you working? And it goes from 6 to 20 and you say, this is where I am on the scale. If we look at the time trial response, it's pretty much in the middle. There's no effect of caffeine on how hard you think you're working, but remember you're working harder. So you're performing better in the time trial, but you don't think you're working any harder. And if we look at fixed intensity work, so when you're working at the same intensity, you feel it's easier. So caffeine is having this profound effect on how hard you are finding exercise. And that's been shown lots of times and certainly summarised in these, uh, these meta-analyses. Um, so, yeah. And it's also associated, there's a mild pain relieving effect of caffeine. And we think that that might be the reason for that response and might also be the reason why we perform better as well. So the last one of the physiological responses I, I wanted to show you was um, this one on blood lactate. 
So if you're not familiar with blood lactate, you may very well have heard TV commentators and athletes talk about lactic acid. And it's generally in, in, in tough races and they'll say, oh, his legs are filling up with lactic acid. Um, so this is, we're measuring here blood lactate, which is essentially an indicator of lactic acid concentration. Again, starting off easy, getting harder, harder, harder. That's our placebo response. That's our caffeine response. Same intensity, this. These are same intensities, just getting harder and harder. So caffeine is increasing blood lactate concentration or lactic acid concentration. And that was all the way through the profile. If we look at this range again, so where Mo Farah's running, if we fix the intensity, then we confirm that previous slide. So at the high end of that previous slide, we see we've got a clear effect of caffeine on lactic acid concentration. So we get an increase of about 0.7 of a millimole per litre. Um, doesn't matter too much, but it'll make more sense when I show you the next slide. When people do a time trial, that value is over double what it was on the previous slide. Uh, and again, this is the one I'm working on at the moment. This is the one I'm writing up at the moment. So what we can say here is, unlike heart rate, when you're doing a time trial, you're getting an increase in lactate. Part of it is coming from the increase in intensity, but this time we can say that part of it is also coming from the fact that caffeine's having a physiological effect on us that's causing that lactic acid concentration to increase. And I think the other thing to point out here is performance is going up, lactic acid concentration is going up. You will hear every single TV commentator say people are getting slower because they're accumulating lactic acid. We've known that isn't the case for a long time. We just need to educate our TV commentators and athletes that that's the case. <laughs> Okay, so that was all I wanted to do on endurance exercise and physiological responses. The last few slides I want to talk a bit about sprinting, caffeine and sprinting, because there hasn't been a huge amount of work done on this. So every time I do a study, I search the area and I usually put one of these tables together to, so I can understand, get a feel for what's going on. So I've got all this, I found all these studies that had looked at caffeine and some kind of sprinting performance. And I kept reading in re review articles, people would say the effects of caffeine and sprinting is unclear. And I thought, okay, so I put this table together. Now I've highlighted them in blue, the responses, all the ones where they showed no effect. So I've got all these studies and I was going, no effect, no effect. I was like, Why are people saying that this is unclear? Because to me, it seems pretty clear. Um, now, the only dis we had one discrepancy here where they showed an increase in peak power. But you can see these same authors did a subsequent study and found no effect. And the reason these review articles were saying it's unclear was this one study by Anselm, where they found an increase in peak power, maximum peak power. So I, I read through this study again, uh, and I looked at the sample. And I thought, well, there's 14 participants. That's pretty reasonable in a, a physiology study. But they had males and females, and there can be some issues when you use both from a statistical standpoint. So I thought, mm, there's maybe an issue there. I looked at the dose. They gave a fixed dose rather than a, a body mass relative dose. So particularly when they got males and females, I thought, well, the females are going to be lighter, so it's going to mean they're going to get a, heavier, a higher dose than the males. I thought, OK, there's an issue there. And then I also looked, have they measured blood caffeine concentration? In other words, when the people turned up and they were having the placebo, were they really free from caffeine? Or had they inadvertently had a cup of coffee in the morning or whatever? So I thought there's issues here. So I thought, we can fix these issues. We'll do this study again. We'll repeat it. And to be honest, I thought we will find no effect and we can put the whole idea to bed. So I'll show you what we found. So what we've got here is gradually increasing resistances is the best way to describe it. In other words, you, people are, are sprinting on a, on a cyclogometer for six seconds. There's lots of recovery between each bout. 
Um, but essentially at 0.4 your legs are spinning like mad because there's next to no resistance. And up at this end you're struggling to turn the pedals around. So what we see is that your peak power output goes up with increasing resistances to this point where it starts to level off and then it's, it would then start to dive away. If we look at the caffeine, well, it doesn't look like there's much happening until we get to this end and it looks like there's a bit of a divergence going on. So if I take those two lines off and we just focus on the peak, peak power output, so the best power output they did, which was right up at this end, we found there was a significant difference. We found there is an effect of caffeine on sprinting performance. Effectively, when we op we we um, optimise their ability to sprint. So going back to our table from before, I'm going to add our results now to the bottom. So we found the same result. We found exactly the same result as Anselm found, which made me go, oh, "Hang on a minute, what's going on here?" Um, so that's, it's, it's one of those bizarre circumstances where you think, is there something wrong with all these studies then? Um, and I noticed a couple of things. Most of them had used 30 second sprints, 30 second, we call them wing gate sprints, cyclogometer sprints they are. Um, and there's some evidence that in a 30 second sprint, people adopt something of a pacing strategy, subconsciously, but, but they do. So um, I thought, okay, well let's let's address this issue then. So this is the latest study. This is this paper's in review at the moment. So I just explained to you what we did. People had to do nine visits to our laboratory. We compared a 10-second sprint with a 30-second sprint. So the first thing to notice, this is just for the placebo, is that the 10-second sprints were higher than the 30. We are telling these people, go flat out, right, as soon as we say go, we want you to sprint. Um, and somehow, their brain's going, this is going to hurt, I'm just going to hold back a little bit. And yet, they have no idea that they're doing that. The other thing to be aware of is, if we do a standard resistance for these tests, we get a lower power output than, than if we optimise that resistance. It's a bit like... If you, if you have, most people have ridden a bike at, at some time, if the gear was too low and you were spinning your legs around, you'd be spinning them around and not being able to generate any power output. But if, and that's why in the real world you select a gear, don't you? You pick the best gear to optimise performance. And when we optimise it, we get a higher power output. If we put our caffeine results on there, the thing we see is that under the standard torque, you just can't spin your legs fast enough. So whether you've had caffeine or not, we're not getting an effect on performance. If you're doing a 30 second sprint, I think that the pacing issue prevents caffeine from having a real effect. And if you optimise the power output, but still do 30 seconds, again pacing overrides that response. But if you take pacing out of the equation, and if you optimise the resistance, then we get a significant effect. So there is an effect of caffeine in a real world situation. I've got to wrap this up pretty quickly. Um, caffeine, summary slide, it increases performance. Time trial performance by, yeah, generally about 3%, but it can be as high as 6%. Sprinting performance under normal conditions. Mechanisms probably related to a central effect and an effect within the muscles. Um, and that's linked to a mechanism associated with the antagon antagonism of adenosine receptors, which is way in a in a beyond the scope of this presentation. But there are issues in studies with sample sizes being too small and finding no effect when sometimes there is one and vice versa. Physiological effects. Increases heart rate during time trials, but solely because you're working harder. Reduces how hard you feel you're working. Um, and that probably explains a large part of why you're performing better. Uh, and a clear increase in blood lactate. And I'm going to leave you my final slide. I'm going to finish off in the words, for those of you that remember Porky Pig. <laughs> <laughs> you have to... <laughs> Keeps going. Ha, ha, ha.
Wait for it. <laughs> Thank you very much.